guys are waiting for me. I just got the message. I guess, in theory, we are live. What's up, SRC? Woo! Good to see you guys. Yes, I can see you in the spirit. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'll, I'll tell you what's happening here. Uh, I was, I'm, supposed supposed here. And, uh, um, I was, I'm supposed to be there. and I'm supposed to be there. Uh, let's see what um, happened. My plane never showed up. So my plane was supposed uh, to show up at 3.30 uh, and then so it didn't show up and they said they were uh, having problems with the plane in Seattle. And then, and uh, so not that, that's okay. We, and then, we, we uh, some so we some that, that's okay. We, we, and we had then, um, we had some and then they, there. and so I'm telling the team, look, I'm going to, I'm flying in. So I'm telling the team, look, I'm going to, I'm going to come flying in, walking onto the stage. The team had my microphone ready. Walking onto the stage. All of a sudden, got another update that the plane wasn't going to arrive until 630. The PM. plane wasn't gonna thought, arrive till see, six thirty p.m. Could that still PM. work? I thought, no, that could, could that, that could not. Work? I mean, we could delay no, everything. Could, but if I can walk not, on I mean, the stage at nine delay p.m., you guys are gonna be bummed out. If I can walk on the stage so at nine p.m., you guys are gonna quickly be had out. to pivot, and right? So, and, uh, we quickly and had so, to pivot, uh, right? I called and, our, our, well, and I called so, my bride uh, first, Andrea. I called our, and I said, our, I'm not coming home tonight. Hopefully that's okay with you. I'm not coming home tonight. I called our tech okay team and said, how do we do this? I called um, our tech team and said, how do we do this? I want to speak tonight. You know, I feel like we need to go through this. I want to speak tonight. You know, I feel like we need to go through this. And so our tech team said, yep. We know to uh, do. I just so want to give a shout out said, right yeah, now. We know to do. Uh, I just to want to Michael give a Kibisky, shout out right now to Glenn uh, Sampson, to Michael Kabisky, James to Thompson. Thompson. We have the very best. James We've got Thompson. the most amazing. We have the very tech best. Teams. We've got the Let's most amazing. Let's give them a big, a big. Uh, uh, Let's thanks give them right a big now for being big, just so uh, amazing. Woo! Okay, calm down, calm down. Let's not thank them too much. We don't want it to get to their heads. Um. But anyways, they figured out a way to do this. I trust that I'm on the screens there. And you guys, um, I am right now at Ignite Faith Church in Redmond, Oregon. These guys, I love these guys. They have taken such good care of me. We had such a great time this morning. This is their fifth, 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 this is their fifth birthday as a church today. And they asked if I would come and do their happy birthday service. We had such a great time. Uh, this morning, and, and and I want to introduce you guys real quick to these pastors because they're here with me. And so, you guys, give it up right now for Pastor Josh and Bernice Scheidler. Come on, you guys, come say hi. Yeah, like right now. Come on, come on. Woo! Here they come. Here they come. Come on, guys. Get, get in here. <laughs> say what's hey. up. Yo, SRC. Uh, look, look at the shirt, guys. Repping. I figured if we were going to go live, you missed it. Turn around again. Oh, we, you we, got a hoodie. We, we should what? Been, whoa. A hoodie. As if the 15-minute Renko commercial wasn't enough promo. But all right, you guys. Go, go you get guys the go. merch. Uh, hey, we're so sorry your pastor couldn't be there tonight. Secretly, we hijacked him so we could have one more night. And uh, man, today was awesome. He brought the fire. It was incredible. You guys are super blessed to have Andrea and Darren as your pastors, along with the rest of the team there. You guys are like family to us. Yep. And uh, yes. yeah. We had such a blast today. Thank you for yeah. sharing your pastor with us. We love Pastor Darren and Andrea. We love SRC. We yeah. think you guys are amazing. Um, and we love it when we get to come down there. So, yeah. you know, I, I just was thinking, with all this change, you guys navigate through things so beautifully. You navigate through change and difficult situations so beautifully. And I actually saw this picture, just even as I feel like your past is being stretched right now. I actually saw this picture of like a stretching, but it wasn't a rubber band. It was like, you know when you stretch something and it never goes back to its original size when it's been really stretched out? And I just feel like... God is actually stretching you guys out in the season. Yeah. He's, he's stretching you out and you're actually not going to go back to the original size. He's stretching you out. And when you get stretched out, I feel like you actually expand 
and you take on new territory and new ground. So, so even with the uncomfortableness of stretching, even with the uncomfortableness of change and, and challenging situations, I just feel like you guys as a church are being stretched out and you're actually expanding and you're taking new ground and you're taking new territory. So we just bless you guys yeah. as a church. Yeah. We love you. We're rooting for you guys from Redmond, Oregon. We think you're amazing. So God, just bless them, yeah. bless them, Amen. bless them in Jesus' name. Yeah. Yeah, we love Amen. you guys. She's the she's the spiritual one. That's why we have her up here as well, so she can bring you an encouraging word at the same time. But yeah, we really do love you guys. We honor you guys. We honor your pastors. We honor your leadership team. And uh, uh, don't just because you live there doesn't mean you can miss out on the conference. So get to the conference because we'll see you in a couple of weeks. We're so excited. We can't wait to be a part of this thing called Renaissance Coalition, Renco for short. So. We love you guys. <laughs> Hashtag Renko. Here's, here's your pastor. <laughs> <laughs> love you guys. Love you guys. Love you guys. Awesome, you guys. Uh, so, yeah, be praying for these guys. Uh, Josh needs Jesus. Bernice has found him. In his, but, uh, no, these guys are so stinking cool. Hey, um, all right. Let me, if this is your first time maybe watching online, and by the way, if you're watching online, everybody hit share right now. So let's do that. Um, and, uh, but maybe this is your first time at our church or watching online. You're like, what are you doing preaching about socialism? You should be preaching um, about Jesus. You should be teaching about the gospel, about, about spiritual things. And, um, and so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you why we're talking about this. Listen, I would rather not be talking about this, um, uh, but this isn't my idea. You see, we're in the summer months, and I said to the team, how about this? How about on Sunday nights, we talk about some topical issues, okay? And so you know me. I love to go through books of the Bible. In fact, on October 10th, we're going to begin our, uh, our series of going through the book of Genesis. I've got the first 12 weeks already carved out. You guys, in that first 12 weeks, we're still in chapter 1. Okay, so this is going to be a long series. We're going to take our sweet time in Genesis. You know me, I love to study books of the Bible. Okay, and, but I thought, hey, we've got some time. Why don't we um, talk about some topical things, things that are taking place, things that are hitting the news right now. And I thought, instead of me framing this thing out, why don't I ask uh, you uh, and our Sierra Valle Center community and friends of SRC on Facebook. So I put out a message. I said, hey, I want you to let me know what topics, what issues you want for us to study together as, as a church. And if you see a topic that interests you, I want you to hit like on there and, and that'll be your way of voting. And so people began submitting the topics that they wanted me to address. And all these wild uh, 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 cultural hot topic buttons uh, started coming in. And so we started the series, you guys, talking about hybrid beings, okay? Um, and then we started talking about education. And then we started talking about gender and gender theory. Um, and then last week, we, uh, we talked about critical race theory. So we're talking about things that, that, that you wouldn't typically talk about at the church. And one of the things that we've been learning is that, um, that the culture is at, where it is at right now, because of the conversations that the church has been willing to have or unwilling to have. So we are at where we are at as a nation because of the topics that the church has been willing to discuss and because of our unwillingness to talk about some of the things that are actually taking place. And not just in church meetings, but our courage to even have conversations at home with our families regarding the things that are taking place. Discussion needs to take place at home. It needs to take place within the ecclesia. Because if we are not having discussion, then most likely we are not governing. If you are not with your friends and your family, talking about the spirit of the world and God's perspective and how he wants to address it, then most likely we're not using our authority and our gifts and our talents and our abilities to carve out a kingdom realm on the earth. So this is what we say we're going to do. We're going to dive into seven weeks discussing seven various problems, but then we're going to dwarf it. We're going to crush it. We're going to obliterate the principalities and powers that are tied to these topics, which are no doubt tied to a spirit of hope deferred and fear, intimidation. The, uh, these topics that we're talking about, this is our modern-day Goliaths that are facing our nation 
and are facing our generation. And the question is, is, is there a David who's willing to say, you think you're big, but my God is bigger. You think you're great, but my God is greater. And who do you think you are? You are going down on my watch and because of me. And we framed out this series called The Problem and the good news. And this is what this means, that no matter what problem you're facing individually, no matter what problem our nation is facing, we have the good news, and it's not information, it's the incarnation. We have the good news, and that is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is our Lord Jesus Christ who is our hope of glory that is residing within us and his dominant frequency of righteousness, peace, and joy is residing in the sanctuary there, is residing here that we are connected in the natural through technology. Likewise, we're also connected by the Spirit. Knowing that the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be the fuel that we need to subvert all of these anti-Christ ideologies that want to rob Christ Jesus of his glory within our nation and within our generation. So, you guys requested it. You wanted for us to discuss the rise of socialism in America. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Are you guys ready? All right, here we go. Thank you. 
Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So we're going to begin, first of all, by uh, defining what is socialism. Socialism is the belief that the government should be in total control of property and business. Again, socialism is the belief that government should be in control of property and business. And it's authoritarian, okay, which basically means that it is a system that doesn't exist to truly serve but to reinforce strict obedience and authority using force okay and so uh that is uh, 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 the authoritarian political uh system that is behind socialism now under socialism people aren't allowed to own things for themselves instead Socialist governments regulate the economy by taking your possessions, your money, and your property and giving it to other people. Socialists will say that this will create an equal society where no one is too rich, right? Where the government will take care of everyone. And socialists believe in collectivism instead of individualism. Socialism is the opposite of a free market capitalism that our country is built on. Socialists, they don't believe in America's most important values, values like freedom and ownership of property and the pursuit of happiness. Now, when we're talking about socialism and capitalism, we're talking about economies. And there are two different economies. You have the capitalist economy, which our, company, which our country is built upon. And the, the capitalist economy refers to the kind of econ economy where people um, pay money in order to purchase goods, um, and then they have to make money. And in our country, in order to make money, you have to work for it. Okay, And if you don't have enough money, then you have to work harder. And, um, and maybe, well, and there is the opportunity to do this, you can even work smarter and become more successful. So that's the interesting thing about watching people that uh, immigrate. Of the fact that they can work harder and make more money, they can work smarter and be more successful. 
and they take advantage of that. Uh, uh, some, some, some people, and, and, and some people that immigrate here from other countries, like, this is incredible because the sky is the limit. What an amazing country. And then other people don't think that that is as cool. Uh, and a socialist economy, um, socialism, is the kind of system where now the government controls everything. And property is supposed to be owned and shared by everybody. And instead of competing, everybody is supposed to work together to produce whatever society needs. Everybody is supposed to be equal, okay? And no one is supposed to get rewarded for working harder. Since everybody is dependent on the government, no one is rewarded for their work. No, uh, and, and there's no incentives for success or innovation. Under socialism, successful people are seen as the enemy and they're punished. Since they need to give away what they have earned, that's the obligation. If you're successful and you're stepping into this blessing, how, how dare you? You need to give it back up. And then under communism, which is the most extreme form of socialism, people aren't even allowed to have their own private property. Now, we talked about this last week. We're going to look at the, the patriarch of socialism, the, the genesis of socialism. And it takes us back to a dude by the name of Karl Marx, who framed out what he called his three phases um, of socialism that should lead to utopia. Okay, the three phases that lead to utopia. The first phase is that a revolution must take place in order to overthrow the existing government. And we're certainly seeing that right now. I mean, that's the whole thing when we, when we were discussing all these different critical theories. Anytime you hear the word critical, what it's saying is that a revolution must take place in order to subvert and overthrow the abuses that are a part of our American system that go all the way back to the beginning. So because they are a part of the roots of our country, Critical says everything in our country must be uprooted, including our Constitution, including our Bill of Rights, that it all must be destroyed, that a revolution is needed in order to overthrow the existing government. Phase two says that a dictator or elite leader must gain absolute control um, and collectivi uh, collectivization of property and wealth must also take place. So first of all, you have to have a revolution and you have to have a revolutionary. And we are seeing that now. We are hearing the radical voices that say it's time for revolution. It's time to overthrow everything. It's time to desecrate the, the people, the values, the sites that our country was built on. And you see revolutionaries with this aim and desire to not bring peace and not bring um, uh, 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 understanding and reconciliation, but to bring violent revolution. And this isn't new. I mean, King Solomon would say, is there really anything new under the sun? What we see is that history repeats itself. Now, as I, we just had an earthquake. Ah, I'm just kidding. That's all right. Now this is going, here we go. Get this fixed back up here. Let's take it from <laughs> history <laughs> repeats itself. All right. So when you have the early socialist um, agenda and you had these different uh, guys that were hearing this and saying, yeah, this is me. Then we can look back in history to look at the early socialists that radicalized it, began starting revolutions, and that's what brings us back to our first dictator, our first evangelist of socialism that we'll look at tonight, and it is Adolf Hitler. Now, Adolf Hitler was the chancellor of Germany from 1933 to 1945. He was the man who initiated the deadliest conflict in human history, World War II. He actually started off as a spy, uh, following uh, the defeat of Germany in World War I and uh, the German uh, 18, 19, 19 November Revolution, Adolf Hitler's job was fishing for information on activities of small political parties and groups. 
um, it was then that he tried becoming a speech maker at a political gathering. He felt that he was in his element and soon became the leader of the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party that later became known as the Nazis. After assuming the position of Chancellor of Germany, Hitler suppressed the political opposition in the country and established the Gestapo, the secret state police, and a, a system of concentration camps. He started mass Jew baiting, which later grew into the genocide of the Jews throughout Europe. Hitler wiped out one-third of the Jewish population of the world, an event known as the Holocaust. Democratic freedoms were, by that time, long gone in Germany. Planning to launch a large-scale aggression, Hitler initiated one of the largest economic and infrastructure development campaigns in the country's history. By 1938, Hitler's regime had occupied Austria and, and Czechoslovakia, and in 1939, by attacking Poland, he provoked the start of World War II, which took the lives of over 70 million people, the majority of whom were civilians. After the defeat of Germany in 1945, Adolf Hitler committed suicide. The next dictator that we're going to look at that, uh, that was a huge fan of socialism, he saw there must be a revolution and there must be a revolutionary, was Pol Pot. Now he was the, the ruler in Cambodia from 1979, 75, sorry, to 1979. He was an unusual dictator in that he wasn't really trying to build up his personality and make himself popular. Instead, he focused all of his passion on killing as many of his own country people as he could. During the four years of the uh, Khmer Rouge Party regime in Cambodia, about three million people, a fourth of the, of the country's population, were murdered, brutally wiped out. Pol Pot imposed a version of ag agrarian collectivization, forcing city dwellers to relocate to the countryside to work at collective farms and forced labor projects. The Khmer Rouge targeted everyone considered potentially dangerous, which included the military and specialists of all kind, including teachers, doctors, and officials, and educated people in general. Both education and religion were seen as the enemy. In fact, every time you begin to look at socialism and communists within a country, you'll always see an antichrist spirit. Why? Because Christianity is all about liberty. It's all about freedom. It's all about truth. Jesus would say, you know the truth, the truth would set you free. It's all about the suppression of truth. So religion was abolished and schools were turned into prisons for sites of torture, which was widespread. Beating people to death with iron bars and hose, running over them with bulldozers, burning or burying people alive, drowning and throwing them to crocodiles were all popular with this evil monster, Pol Pot. Hundreds of thousands of Cambodian people dug their own graves, which are now referred to as the killing fields. Now this is history, and, uh, 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 but what, what about right now? Like what's happening right now? I want to actually show you a video from a gal who escaped North Korea when she was 13 years old. And now you need to know that people don't escape North Korea any longer. Uh, that, that the country is completely fortified with landmines. And, uh, and, and I want you to hear about what is taking place right now in North Korea. But even within that prison, there's another prison that is called Aozi. 
They had to eat each other to survive. I mean, Mao killed 50 million people with a man-made famine. And this is what government is capable of. Oppressing people, killing people, torturing people, starving people, raping people. Hi everyone! Welcome to my channel. My name is Yemi Park and I'm a North Korean de facto human rights activist. So guys, today in this video, I am going to talk about top secret. So you better stay till the end of this video. Uh, I have talked about North Korea many times before in these videos, but I haven't talked about, about this topic yet. And which is, it's a place called ROG. It's on the map of North Korea in the northern, northern top part. Uh, there's a saying for North Koreans, what this means is, Ah, Ozimara, which means, oh, don't come here. So there's a place called the Aozi that is northern part of North Korea. It's in the mining town. And this place is set up to show us it's almost a gas chamber, the arsenal for North Koreans. If you commit a crime or if your great great grandfather would commit a crime, you go right here in this town. And I know it doesn't make sense, like entire North Korea is very oppressed, concentration type of country, right? Entire countries became a prison. But even within that prison, there's another prison that is called Aozi. So it is a town where from after Korean War in the 50s, they captured a lot of uh, soldiers that were fighting in the North Kore I mean, South Korean side. They would catch them and then send them here. And then if the family of members who committed a crime, like either their grandfather was a landowner, they would send them here. But not only that, so guys, recently there has been the Olympics, right? We all saw the Olympics. In North Korea, if you go compete in the Olympics and you lose, guess what happens? Of course you get punished. <laughs> you literally get punished to lose. And this, what breaks my heart about this is that this Atlas North Korea do not even get fed war. And as a lot of games, they don't even have the, those. I mean, the soccer players one time, they were playing mm. in the international game. The regime could not even buy them uniforms. So they had to borrow some other team's uniform and the shoes that was not even there fitting their shoe size. They had to run and compete in the games with that environment. Not to mention get a training and the nutrition and all of things. They cannot even afford a uniform and the shoes for the soccer players. And then when they lose, the regime send them to this place called Aozi. This place is collected with people what North Korea says Bandong is like anti-revolutionary people. It can be all sorts of criminals, like, which is all political criminals, which means you did not, you let the portraits of Kim's be burnt. You said something when you're drunk and said something bad things about the regime. All these people with their children go and live here in this town. It's a very northern part, unbelievably cold. There's no resources. There's nothing goes in there other than just coal mining. So the regime puts them in this town. And even though when the, there's a Soviet who were subsidizing North Korean economy, the regime would not give them public rations. So these people wasn't getting fed. And one of the person who escaped from there, and she's been talking about her experience, and I, I couldn't believe it. But this is the only people though understand what was happening in North Korea. These are the people who actually fought actively against the Communist Party that was rising up in North Korea. Like me, my family had no clue what was going on. Only people knew what was happening went to this town called Aoji. And in this town, of course, the people. You know, they were literally saying how they had to eat each other to survive. And the things that are happening is unbelievable. Uh, when the regime putting them in this coal mining, they don't even feed them. So the only way they can be fed is by stealing from the government's own the collective farm. Because you cannot farm in North Korea because nobody can own a private property, nobody can own a land. 
So they, if these people starving and go to collective farm and stealing some corn and feed their children. So where there's a family whose children were starving, the parents went into the collective farm and store some corns and brought home and fed their children. And the North Korean regime found out. So they put them on the firing squad. And the most unthinkable thing about these public executions is that they put the children and mothers and fathers of these people on the first front like, row, right in front of them. They shoot them and kill them and publicly execute them. And what another thing is, in North Korea, there's no such a thing called a minor. Because the kids are the shortest, they put the youngest from the top, the first row, and it goes with your height. So five years old, six years old, four years old, standing, sit down in the very first row, and then eight years old, 10 years old, 12, 11, 15, and then adults. That's how they put people in the row. And in front of the family members of these children, the regime brutally executes these people. So this, co this place called Aozi that I really want you to all know because this kind of place that exists in this 21st century. And what shocks me, horrifies me, is that as a humanity that we are, we even understand that animals have rights. The human beings are being treated this way, that we do not do anything about it. And the governments and the, any government leaders, the world leaders, don't do anything about it. While they are talking about justice every single day in America. I know that when individuals know about what is going on inside North Korea, that we are going to care. We are going to speak for these people who cannot speak for themselves. And in that AOZ right now, the people who fought bravely against the communists, their children and their grandchildren are there. And this town is the completely forgotten, not known from the rest of the world. So I hope that you can help me to shine the light in this darkest corner of our world. And hit that like button so YouTube can recommend this video to everybody. And people really know, when we lose our liberty, how evil government, government can become. I think this is what struggles me the most being in America right now is that people, there's no limitation for the evil to be, right? I mean, Mao killed 50 million people with a man-made famine. And this is what government is capable of oppressing people, killing people, torturing people, starving people, raping people. Nothing has been more dangerous than the government has been to individuals and to the humanity. And I see so many warning signs. I see so many similarities that I see in America now with this woke culture, white guilt. I mean, this thing exactly the guilt by association because your great, 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 great grandpa owned a slave. Now somehow you are responsible for it and you should feel guilty about it. And about like, you know, controlling speech and all the censorship we are going towards is what the dictator's handbook is almost. That now between Americans, there's really less trust and less trust every single day I witness. This is what dictators want when we divide it, when we stop trusting each other. We are going to only relying on government. And that's what their ultimate, ultimate goal is for them to gain that control and taking every liberty that we have away from us so they can become almighty God and enslave us forever. So thank you guys for helping me in this journey to speak the you know, truth about the, this evil regime and what I see in America. Please join my Patreon because with the censorship in this age, your support really helped me to keep making these videos and keep speaking out. I love you guys and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Wow. Um... And if you go and you check out uh, you, you, um, you Know Me Park, okay, Y-E-O-N-M-I Park, you can hear talk about things such as the, the total and complete gov governmental control over language. So she talks about how in North Korea, there is no word for love. And so she grew up never, never hearing... Um, uh, her parents say that they loved her because there, there, no, there was no word for that. Uh, in North Korea, there's no word for rape. Um, uh, 
she talks about how uh, the Un dynasty took the Bible and made that the story of their family line. And so there's no Bibles, but when you hear about uh, the Kim Jong Un, you know, him and his dynasty, his family, they've hijacked the story of the Bible. Uh, for there was a father in the dynasty that so loved North Korea that he gave his own son, and it's just a complete and total perversion of the biblical of the biblical message. Um, and she tells her story. Uh, she was actually rescued by Christians um, and was able to get um, uh, out of North Korea. Such a such a remarkable story. Such a sad sad story, um, and certainly such a warning uh, even to, to our to our country. And you guys, all of this, all of this is, all all this murder, rape, uh, suppression of language, um, uh, uh, the removal of religion is all in order to get to the achievement of utopia. The only problem is all these governments, all these nations have attempted socialism and communism and promising a culture where everybody's middle class where all your needs are met, where you, you get education and, and food and, and housing, that you get everything uh, that you need, but no society has ever actually done it. Why? Because in every communist society, they end up using all of their bandwidth trying to kill everybody that, that's in disagreement with their ideology. Karl Marx established the 10 essential tenets of communism. And in this, he basically states the government is literally in control of everything from banking to education to labor. That would be, you know, all all the factories, transportation, uh, agriculture and farming, um, all uh, the total uh, abolition of all private property. Number seven, property rights, confiscation. Number eight, heavy income tax. Um, uh, in order, and it's an, it's an adjusting income tax in order to penalize the rich. You have to set up a system where nobody can succeed. Okay? Um, elimination of rights of, of inheritance. Karl Marx did not believe in inheritance. He did not believe in passing on anything to your children. When you die, where should it go? To the government. Of course it should go to the government. Give it to the government. Uh, and um, regional, regional planning. And so we think, man, this would never, right? This would never work in America. Like nobody would even want this in America. And yet there are powerful people in powerful places that are planting seeds of propaganda to take us this way. In fact, the majority of our higher learning institutions are teaching socialism as the redemptive uh, destiny for our country. In fact, I read several articles that are claiming it's not that we're on a trajectory to become a socialist com- country, but we already are a socialist country. Even one article stating that 75% of our country's budget is already for socialist programs. We talked about this. I'm going to show you a video here in a second. And it was shown at the Economic Forum. And, uh, and, and it's, going to go, it's going to go quick. And, I, and the whole thing about socialism, it's, it's you got to move quick and you got to seed stuff quick. You got to say stuff quick and you got to, the, the most shocking kinds of things, you front load it at the very beginning. So you need to pay attention because the very first slide, I want you to pay, I want you to pay attention to what these guys are pitching for the United States of America, the World Economic Forum vision for our future.
Did you guys see the, the, the first slide that, that, that went up? It said, in the future, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Let me see here. Been there, done that. See, Pastor Dan, what are you talking about? And why was that? What was that? Was that a, yep. Was that a pilgrim hat? Yeah, this is actually kind of crazy. Did you know that we've actually already tried socialism in our country? And it was even before Karl Marx published his manifesto. So when the pilgrims first came to America and they set up their colony, they actually thought, hey, let's set this up in such a way where we will practice collectivism uh, and we'll practice basically practical socialism. And nobody will have to work. Um, we'll, sh we'll have all things in common. We'll share our, we'll share our crops. Um, nobody will have land. Uh, everything, will, everything will just belong to, to the colony. And what happened? Well, uh, they began starving to death. Literally, like a spirit of apathy and lethargy and laziness came upon the colony. And that's when the leaders within the colony said, this isn't working, right? Like our our govern our uh, our incorrect and unbiblical governmental structure is actually enabling the depravity, the disposition within the human soul that wants to not be a leader, that wants to not be a worker, that wants to not be a participator. This is actually corrupting our colony, and our families are starving. Why? Because of that, because of, simply because of a sinful disposition. So what they do? They privatized it. They, they actually swung, the, the pendulum swung in our country from this place where they had really um, everything, everything in common. And they uh, set up a private market. And they began to uh, 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 give people their own property. And what they said is that if you don't work your property, you know, you can farm, you can set this up. But if you don't work, you don't eat. Doesn't that, doesn't that, that, that sounds familiar, right? Like if you don't, don't work, you don't eat. Yeah, that's right, because that's in the Bible. People say, food, that should just be a right. No, 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 the Bible says it's not a right, <laughs> right? If you don't work, you don't eat, okay? And so it's really, really interesting that within our own country, we've been there, we've done that, and our own, we, and, and we face the consequences. Families were actually dying. Now, within socialism, it says that everybody should be equal. So the promise is equality, right? We all want to be the same, right? And that sounds nice. But the reality is, is that within a socialist country, the bandwidth isn't used to bring about equality. The bandwidth is used to punish and reduce those who are successful, who are smart, and who are rich. So the only way that we bring equality is to set up a class war and every issue within society, every issue within our culture, it exists because of the war between the rich and the poor. The devil's not the problem. What devil? Satan's not the problem. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Who do you think the thief is? The thief is the rich. The rich must be punished, right? Amazon, like if you're in Seattle, right, within our own city, you have our, the, the leaders of the city of Seattle, these socialist leaders in Seattle that are supposed to be bringing Seattle into a place of greater prosperity, right, and glory. And, and so how are they doing that? They're viewing the businesses within Seattle as the enemy and they're sabotaging the success of our leaders are sabotaging our own city's success. Why? Because in socialism, the end justifies the means, which is why within all of these countries, they can rape, they can kill, they can murder, they can, they can kick religion out. None of it matters because they've promised a beautiful future. Therefore, they can do whatever they want in the present. What's interesting is if you were to go to Seattle right now, man, Seattle has so much potential, right? There is a spirit, a, a pioneer spirit within our city, right? What would it look like if we had leaders that, that, could, that could take just a few biblical concepts, leaders that could be smart enough to learn from human history and recent history and present uh, what's making history right now in other countries and say, hey, 
maybe that's not a good idea, <laughs> right? Like, hey, maybe Fifth Avenue is completely trashed right now. Maybe we could clean up our city. Maybe there could be some solutions for the homeless. Maybe there could be, right? But instead of, instead of disrupting um, uh, unhealthy systems, they're taking these horribly corrupt and demonic systems that have come from a realm, an anti-human realm, a realm that does not honor life, that hates human life, that wants to replace human life. That's all part of the transhuman agenda to replace humans on the earth. And you could, it, it, and this, it, this is a conspiracy. This is being written up in all the mainline, uh, 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 all of our state-run media sources are, <laughs> are saying it out of their own mouth that humans are the problem. Right, Bill Gates. Humans are the are the are are the problem, and so uh, we're going to quickly do a, a quick study here of of um, uh, where am I at? The history of socialism in other countries, and we will begin by looking at China. So, China became a communist country uh, in the forties after a violent civil war. And instead of creating a nice place to live, that's what was promised to them, utopia, that's what they always promise. Everyone's gonna be happy, everybody's gonna be fed, right? Um, uh, uh, everyone's gonna be treated equally. Instead of doing that, the Chinese communists caused terrible suffering to the Chinese people, including food shortages that caused millions of people to starve to death. Isn't it incredible? Hey, follow us, we'll lead you. And then, we, and then we end up killing you, right? It's just so sad. Cens censorship became a, a big deal in China, right? Um, and the government has made it clear that it will go to any length to control information. The Chinese government strictly controls the news spread through the internet and mass media. Uh, 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 and the government decides what people should know and what they shouldn't know. Uh, China is so bad that even Google and Facebook chose to either leave China, okay, or they were kicked out of China. That's how bad China is, that even Google and Facebook can't survive there. And that's, that's telling you something. Um, uh, they didn't stay there, but they could, they could fund uh, labs there. That's, that's kind of that's interesting. You see in China, the abolishment of religion, of the Christian faith, right? Um, it's interesting. We just had, uh, I got a good friend that does ministry in China. He was telling Andrea and I um, uh, over dinner that there's like this social media thing that every citizen is required to have that gives you a score. So everybody has a score. And there are these people and they, they monitor you and they monitor your social behavior in real life. And, um, and what happens is, is let's say... Uh, let's say you break the speed limit or you jaywalk or something like that, um, your score goes down. Let's say, uh, so there's, it's a performance-based society for the citizens, except everybody knows each other's score. And if your score gets low enough, then they restrict what you're able to do and not do within the society. And that includes if, you're, if, you're, if your score gets low enough, then they will actually forbid you from even traveling. Okay, but interesting enough, if your score gets low enough, you can get it up just by writing a nice check to the communist uh, government. Cuba, the story of Cuba. Fidel Castro took control of Cuba after leading, again, you guess it's always the same story. A revolution, okay, against a dictator. At first people thought that things would get better for Cuba, but then Castro turned out to uh, a turn to communism and made an alliance with the Soviet Union. Castro had many people who disagreed with communism killed and confiscated property, businesses from people. The Cuban communists weren't able to run the economy. So Cuba is still famous for, uh, for its cigars um, and its technology in cars from the 1950s. So if you go to Cuba, it hasn't progressed. Right, because they don't re reward innovation or progress. It's like the country is still stuck in the 1950s because communism, socialism hits pause uh, for progress within countries. Let's talk about Venezuela. 
Venezuela was a country with a promising future. It had a functioning democracy and a rapidly developing economy and a growing middle class. All the important indicators, including education and health care, uh, foreign investments, everything was going the right direction for Venezuela. It wasn't perfect, but the mood was hopeful and with good reason. Um, and now all of that promise is gone. It is considered a failed state. Services like power and water are sporadic and most basic consumer goods from bread to toilet paper are usually in short supply. Sounds like, uh, sounds like uh, America during 2020. Crime has skyrocketed. Freedom of the press is non-existent. Democracy has been replaced by a virtual dictatorship. In 1999, then candidate President Hugo Chavez promised to lead the people of Venezuela to a socialist utopia. His theme was hope and change. Venezuela is a nation of great wealth, he said, but it's being stolen from by its citizens and the evil capitalists and the evil corporations. This wrong should be righted. He assured voters that if they elected for him, and if they did, and they did to their regret, Chavez drew great inspiration from his mentor, Fidel Castro, and like his mentor, he enjoyed giving great speeches that sometimes lasted for hours. He even gave himself his own television show where he would break out into spontaneous singing. The government, uh, the government he assured everyone, would be run by these businesses better than private enterprise. And the profits he would share with the people. And everybody loved that. Yay, awesome. But he tore up the contracts uh, with multinational oil and gas companies and demanded that they pay much higher royalties. And when they refused, he told them all to leave. His image was praised by Hollywood celebrities, guys like Sean Penn and Danny Glover. They came over to Venezuela and like, this guy is, this, this guy's a real leader. This guy is awesome. Progressive politicians from the USA and Europe praised him lavishly. Socialism, it always looks like it's going to work in the beginning. Um, and that's when everybody gets fooled. It's easy for governments to confiscate money. And that's what they began doing. They began confiscating money and more money and more money until they bankrupted their own country. Many people decided to leave and make money elsewhere. Uh, Chavez said, he would leave in two years if people weren't happy with him. But like Castro, Chavez had no intention of ever giving up power. He died in office in 2013, replaced by his vice president, Nicolas Maduro. Maduro is Chavez without the, the, without the charisma and without the singing voice. The country is now shunned by the world. It's completely isolated. It's so bad that many international airlines refuse to even fly there. People stand in line for hours just to get food, and sometimes they walk away empty-handed. A, uh, a recent survey found that 75% of Venezuelan adults lost weight in 2016, an average of 19 pounds. This national weight loss program is cynically known as the Maduro diet. Still, he holds power. Onto, op, uh, uh, power, uh, onto power opposition leaders and journalists are punished who report the truth, even thrown in jail. Uh, socialism always promises equality and happiness for everyone, but it always leads, always leads to poverty and misery for everyone. When it comes to uh, socialism, and its influence within a country, socialism always strikes quickly. Even when you look at, uh, it was interesting, even uh, 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 what our own president did on his first day in office, just started executive orders, 
for, for days, just started signing executive orders, moving quickly, quickly, quickly. And I don't necessarily even blame him for that. Um, I, I think the guy is being manipulated by people of, of, uh, definitely above him. But right off the bat, his very first day, he revoked what? The Keystone Pipeline, right? Destroying 11,000 jobs and roughly $2 billion in wages. Right off the bat, you move quickly, okay? Um, socialism is not a fan of free speech. What do we see right now? What have we seen just this last year? There are things that we can talk about. There are things that we can't talk about. There are specific um, drug names where if you even mention the drug name, your YouTube channel will be demonetized or you might even get deplatformed. If you misgender someone, you can get banned from Twitter indefinitely by saying that somebody was a he just because they were born a he, but then all of a sudden decided that they're not a he because they feel like a she, uh, you're not allowed to, to speak your mind anymore, okay? Um, why? Because socialists are not fans of free speech and these things that we've always been able to, always been able to have conversations, always been able to have dialogue, always been able to hear both sides of a story. And now, and now, uh, and now those conversations are being shut down. In socialism, your primary reason for living is to serve the state. Now, I have heard people say over the years, well, but didn't Jesus teach socialism, right? And isn't that what we see in the book of Acts? You know, isn't socialism biblical? Isn't heaven <laughs> socialist? All right. No, no, and no. <laughs> um. When you look at, yeah, the book of Acts, right? They had all things in common, okay? And what does that look like? That means that they chose to sell their property and to give of their possessions into a pot to help the poor, to help those who were, who were struggling. The difference there was that that wasn't Israel imposing, right? Government mandated uh, orders, mandates, that forced you to give up your property, to give up your inheritance, to give these things up, okay? Uh, so that's the difference. They chose out of their own heart and love for each other to be generous, right? And to give to each other, right? Uh, we see that's the heart of our God is to be generous. But one of the things that we don't see that even God himself is, isn't up in the heavens mandating, right? Removing things, why? Because it's the character of the thief to steal, right? And to control and to manipulate, that is not the character and nature of God, nor should it be the character and nature of a, of a church, and nor should it be the character and na nature of a nation. When you see somebody forcing these things, mandating these things, saying, just trust me, you, you can't make these decisions for yourself, just, just trust me, trust the government. We know what is best. We know what, what you should have in your body, right? We know what your kids should have in their body, right? Like, just... A, a, you can trust the government. We're going to need a bigger government. We're going to need more people. Why? Because we're going to be taking over banking and agriculture and business and, and religion. You see, like that could, I, I would say that could never happen in our country. But we went through last year. We went through 2020. Our country was discovered by people who wanted the freedom of religion. And then you have pastors like Rodney Howard Brown that were arrested for hosting a church service. In a free country. Yes, he was let go. All the charges were dropped. It was seen as completely absurd. Yes, um, uh, 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 even, e even, in the, uh, even in the high courts, it was deemed that, that, that we do have freedom to gather and freedom of religion. And yet, there is a socialist agenda that is not content, that is being taught in our public schools, that is being taught in our higher institutions, that is even being taught by churches, by pastors, well, what about heaven? In heaven, nobody will work, right? In heaven, you'll, we're just going to sit around and play harps for 10,000 years, right? No. Like, where do we get this crap? Like, well, like, what did Jesus do in the beginning? Like, when, we look, when you look at Genesis and you see the convergence point between heaven and earth, right? We see the, the beautiful intimacy and relationship that God creates Adam in his own image and likeness, that God creates him by doing what? 
working. Our God creates us by getting his hands dirty, by getting his hands in the dirt. Our God is the only God that actually works. <laughs> you, can, you might have your, your special religion. You might have your stuff that you're into. Your God didn't work. Our God worked and he created us. We're created in the image and likes of the world. And then what God, what God do? I'm getting carried away. He said to Adam, now go and work Eden. Work this place. Expand it. Expand this place. And I believe that when we go to heaven, I believe that work and assignments and, and strategies and carrying out the Father's bidding, I believe that, that we're going to go to heaven and we're going to find that heaven is far more busy than earth. You think, you think um, New York is a, is a city that doesn't sleep where everybody is buzzing. Wait till you go to heaven. We're all going to be on assignment. We're all going to be about our Father's business. Okay? And so this idea that, uh, that, uh, that, that utopia means laziness and apathy and that everything should just be all right. Everything should just be given to you. That is, that's not a part of our religion. That is not a part of our faith. That's not a part of the Genesis story. That's not a part of the Edenic blueprint that was given to us before the curse. That is, that is anti-will. That's anti-lordship. That's anti-king. That's anti-priest. That's anti-Christ. It's a demonic ideology from the pit of hell that, that is sold into the earth and then, uh, and then monsters are able to take it, rearticulate it, set it up as a bait and switch economic system to get people to do manipulative controlling things on the earth and it, it is not fruitful. Just like everything evil, it always looks wonderful up front, right? And then on the back end, there are huge, huge, huge uh, consequences. But... There's good news. Yes, there is good news. Why? Because even in communist China, Christianity is exploding. Here's an article that was uh, published recently saying that the president of China is terrified. Why? Because of Christianity surging in China. It's predicted that there are close to 100 million Christians in China. Christianity is the fastest growing religion in China. It is underground. I remember hearing uh, stories from my dad about going into China, going into hotel rooms that were packed full of people. And they didn't care if they got arrested. They didn't, they didn't care what, uh, what, the, what the price would be. They were in love with Jesus. They were in love with each other. That even in the hardest, darkest places, we are seeing harvest. The Spirit of God is moving and the church of Jesus Christ in America is waking up. It is time for a third great awakening. It is time for the redeemed of the Lord to say so. It is time for us to look at world history, to learn from the past lest the past repeats itself. And I'm so encouraged right now because there are godly institutions, schools, and churches that are making a long-term commitment to begin to assimilate the beauty of the gospel, just like our founding fathers did, to see a righteous government established that is not political, but it is unto the Lord. And I believe that right now, the good news is, is that leaders are being awakened to their identity and their destiny in Jesus Christ. That even as I speak, and maybe even the worship team can, can come, and in just a second, I'm going to hand this back over to Pastor Sandy, and, and uh, you guys can just go after it and, and whatever else. But even as I speak, I believe that the Holy Spirit is hovering there in that room, that big Holy Ghost is hovering and not just to give you goosebumps. He wants to awaken you to who you really are. Why? Because there is radical injustice. I mean, we're talking real injustice, okay? And in, uh, in, in these countries where women are being raped, where children are being trafficked, and, it, and it's just the way that it is. And everybody knows it's happening, but they feel powerless and there's, there's nothing that anyone feels like, like that they, they can do. And this is what I know, that our God, intends to execute justice in every nation on this earth. And we know that our God is going to execute his justice 
through the righteous. And it's time for our hearts to break with the things that break his heart. And it's time for us to repent of our selfishness. It's time for us to repent of, 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 of being so self-obsessed and for advocating our leadership on the earth, for being passive, for being lazy, for being flippant, um, for looking at how Christianity, you know, there are so many Christian socialists in the church. What, what are Christian socialists in the church? They just go to church for what the church can give to them. They just go to the church because they want some bread. They just go to the church because they want some wine. They just go to church because they want to tap into that atmosphere to get their breakthrough. There are so many Christian socialists within the church that believe that, 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 that pastors and ministers and fivefold ministers, that they should do all the work in the heavenlies and that, that the rest of us should just be recipients of their revelation and their encounters with the Lord. And this is what you need to, this is what you need to know. Moses is dead. And that model of ministry is over. And that place where we live our spiritual lives vicariously through men of God is over. It ended 2,000 years ago when the Holy Spirit came not to hover over a man, but to hover over 120 men, women, and children. That, 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 that anointed the whole, God himself came like a mighty rushing wind. And he came where? Above their head. That the fire is on the head. Why? Because it's about headship. It's about authority. And it's about the awakening of the body of Christ to stand up, to speak up, and to repent for shutting up. It's time for you to make some noise. It's time for you to make a ruckus. If, if, if inappropriate things are taking place in, the class, in your children's classrooms, you need to be the squeaky wheel and you need to continue to squeak and squeak and squeak. You need to continue to show up that we speak up and that we pray. And the very last thing this is what the Lord spoke to me, believe it or not, because I know I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling militant tonight, which I think is good. The most important thing is that we don't lose our joy as I cry. That we don't lose our joy. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I felt like tonight, believe it or not, that the Lord wants to release joy to every person watching this broadcast tonight. That the Lord wants to release joy even into that room there in Seattle, Washington. But it's not a giddy, silly, uh, uh, high school, flippant kind of, ha, ah, I'm happy. No, no, no. No, no. This is joy unspeakable and full of glory that will root you to the kind of hope that will not disappoint. It'll be the kind of joy that roots you so deep that you might bleed, you might die, but you will not give up. It'll be this kind of place where you got so much joy that hope deferred will not be able to touch you. It'll be the kind of joyful courage that filled Peter on the day of Pentecost when he went out and he began to preach. You know, he, previously he was terrified of, of the critics. And on that day, the fire of God was burning upon him and inside of him. And he said, we are not drunk as you suppose. He said, we are filled with the Holy Ghost. And that day, the church, in one day, the church of Jesus Christ went from, from 120 believers to 3,000 believers in one day. Why? Because of the joy of the Lord, that joyful courage so possessed Peter when he got up. It is time for, the, for, the, for, the, for a company of possessed Jesus people to get filled with such intoxicating joy that you could care less what people think about you, that you could care less what, a, what another denomination thinks about you, that all you care about is what the Lord thinks about you. Every person watching this, there is a, a divine blueprint and a holy scroll. We know that our Father, uh, that He is the author uh, of, of our lives and that we are his living poetry as Paul would say and that means that you are not an accident your voice is needed your influence is needed and it's time for believers to go from the from 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 the back of the room to the front of the room from the back of the army to the front of the army it's time for us to show up and it's time for us to allow that place where in the past just like Peter we used to run from the critics we used to ignore the critics we used to run from the culture. We used to hide in our little holy charismatic ghettos. And we say, 
that the amount of injustice and the trajectory of demonic ideologies within our country will not prevail. I'm redeemed, okay? And so therefore, I need to join in with this sound, with all of creation, right? That we would join in with this frequency of all of creation. And it is the desire of King Jesus that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done, that righteousness and justice would be executed on behalf of the poor, the widows, and the orphans, that we would see godly government established in cities and nations. I'm not, I'm not looking to get out of here. I'm not looking to get to get to get out of to get out of this evil place. I'm looking to penetrate it. I'm looking to get into the place of chaos and darkness where the entities of darkness are. And within that place, I want to join with my father and declare, let there be light. Let there be government. Let there be righteousness. And I know that's your prayer. Is that your prayer tonight? Is that your prayer? Is that through you? That through your heart, your heart would be so open that you would pray, God, break my heart with the things that break your heart. Lord, give me not just a broken heart, but Lord, give me answers and keys and solutions. Let's pray, you guys. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, and then I want to give it over to, uh, to Pastor Sandy. I want to pray for you. I want to pray that the Lord would open your heart, that he would soften your heart, that he would give you his heart, that if you have perhaps a heart of stone tonight, that he would take that heart and give you a new heart, that he would take the, the hope deferred and give you a fresh start tonight, that he would take that place where you felt like giving up and that he would say, no, it's not time to give up. It's time for you to get back on the starting line because I'm about to fire this gun and you're about to run again. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person standing tonight. And Lord, I pray that our spirits would likewise stand to attention. And Father, I pray that all the mumbo jumbo soulish manipulation that's been allowed to take place within the charismatic church would be exposed for what it is. Lord, and I pray, Lord, that we would tether with your spirit, with your heart, and that we begin to think like kings that we'd begin to function as priests, that we would begin to engage with our union that we have with Christ Jesus, saying in him we live, in him we move, in him we have our being. And that we would begin to pray and to seek your heart and that we'd begin to stand, to truly stand, not in the dark, not in the caves, but that we would truly walk out onto the field saying to this spirit of intimidation and censorship, saying to this, this giant of manipulation and control that thinks it's going to have its way within our country, who are you, you uncircumcised Philistine? Who do you think you are to defy our living God? Not on my watch. Not on my watch. It's not going to happen today. Father, I pray that you would bless each and every one here with an infusion and an impartation of joy right now. That your spirit of joy would come on each and every person here right now. Joy unspeakable, and full of glory. All for the glory of God. I love you guys. I miss you. I wish I could be there in your atmosphere. I could feel the presence of God here moving right now. And so why don't you guys go from glory to glory? Pastor Sandy, you can take it to the, to the next level. I love you guys. And uh, I'll be on a plane tomorrow morning. I'm getting back there with you guys. I love you. See you next week. television and I kept looking at this woman and thinking what what is what is about her and it was uh, I think Wynan is their last name is a singing family yeah okay so it was her and her brother and they were having this conversation that was so full of joy and I'm watching them 
you know, and, and it, it's, it wasn't big manifestations. They were just talking to each other about God. But it, it, was, a, it was an anointing of joy. And it, literally, I watched from my television set like a substance come towards me and hit me right here. I did experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. It wasn't manifestations. It wasn't flopping all over the place. It wasn't catching. There was a joy that hit me that lasted about three hours. And it was, I felt it down into the core of my being. And in that three hours, I did have to deal with something that was a little uncomfortable. It was a lot uncomfortable, actually. But it was the joy of the Lord is our strength. To also, so when we're talking about the joy, we're just gonna. I've asked a few people we're, we're gonna pray a little bit tonight, but we're gonna start out praying in tongues. But it's don't be looking for, don't be looking for something that's fleshy. Don't be looking for that. Just in your spirit, be looking to God, and just see what He wants to do tonight. Because um, so, God, the, I, this was such a powerful message. Such a powerful message. And so, Lord, we just give our yes. We give our yes to what uh, Pastor Darren preached. We give our yes tonight, Lord. And we expect, God, because we're asking, we expect you to show us, to teach us, to guide us, to reveal to us, Lord, uh, our, what our yes really means in this day and age. And we agree in the Spirit, not on our watch not on our watch so let's just start spraying in tongues just a little bit and patty you want to come up jesus thank you lord so i just all week i've had this thing just burning in me that the lord is really wanting a place to tabernacle amongst us he just doesn't want to visit us because this is what's going to shake a nation. It's going to change a nation. Is him tabernacling inside of us. Whoa. Whoa. Yes, Lord. God, we say yes, God. We say yes to you, Lord. We say yes, God. We just don't want a visitation from you, Lord. We want a tabernacle, Lord. We want to encounter you, God, in a new and fresh way, Lord. We want to meet with you, God. We want to come up. We want to ascend into the heavens, Lord, that we're seated there with you in the heavenly places, God. And Lord, it's from this place, Lord, that we are changed from glory to glory, God. We are changed into your image bearer. Lord God that we Lord would bear your image in the earth Lord and so father I just pray tonight God that you would come father Lord that you would just open wide the gates inside of us Lord be lifted up those ancient doors Lord God that the glory of God would come in Lord that you would not only visit us God but father that we would be that habitation Lord for your presence to dwell and live and move and breathe through us father we thank you Lord hallelujah shakabarama Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I was just reminded of Psalm 16, and it says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's a very well-known verse from this, from this psalm. But just a few verses above that, he says this, I have set the Lord always before me because he is my because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Father, I pray for your church in this hour, Lord God. Father, as shakings are coming upon this earth and upon this nation, Lord, we will not be shaken, Lord God, because we set you always before us. Father, I pray that the church in this hour would set you before them, that they would set other things aside, Lord God. They would set their, their, their TVs and news channels and movie programs and, and all the different things that are coming at them. They would set them aside and they would set you before them, Lord God. And Father, in that place, place of setting you before them they would find that place in your presence that place of joy that place of love that place of, accept of acceptance 
in your grace and in your beauty, Lord God. So, Father, I thank you, Lord. I pray, Father, out of this place of joy that there would be an uprising, an uprising on the inside of your church in America, Lord God, and around the world to take a stand in the face of darkness, in the face of injustice, Lord God, or to see your righteousness, to see your kingdom come, to see the kingdom which is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you. We praise you, Father. We just remind ourselves of your victory, Father. We look at the cross, Father. We look at the cross, Father, that you, you are the victor. You are the victor, Father. We look up to you, Father. We, we repent, Father, anywhere we went astray. Whatever we, Father, we got diverted from your direction father you are the king of king you are the lord of lord father the kingdom has established in us father he who is in us is greater than the world father we stand father we shine with your light father we shine in this dark world father we want to take not to ignore what's going on but father we want to proclaim our victory in you jesus christ father you are father the king of king and the lord of lord father we say yes to you tonight father we say yes to you father and we stand in the gap father we ask father your holy present father that is burning in us father and we shine like you want us to do father in this dark world father and we stand stronger than father power of enemy that has been crushed 2000 years ago father and it's been crushed father and we stand strong and we proclaim father we are not going to act like adam but we are going to act like second adam that his name is jesus christ his name is jesus christ and expand the kingdom father like you want that to be father teach us show us holy and mighty name of Jesus. We stand strong, Father. We stand strong. We push forward. We have one choice, to go forward. And the power of darkness has only one choice, to go back. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, David, he had a sling in his hand. It was a very common thing. But God, it was out of relationship with God that he knew how to use that sling to take just little stones and to bring down a giant. And I believe that God wants us to bring down giants. But it starts, it starts with the little things. To bring down those things in our life that God has allowed to be shaken in our lives so that we can see the power of God work in our families. Work in our families as we, as we take that sling and we put in a stone, a very common stone from the ground. And we, and we see the power of God to work in our families, to work in our churches, to work. And then, and then we have the faith to believe, what? This giant is defying our Lord God? How could that even be? So Lord, help us in our lives not to be hopeless and not to think, this, this is too big for me. Lord, you allow things in our lives for a purpose. You allow us to have hardships for a purpose that we will become what you've called us to become and that we will have that faith and that courage that we know that we can take on the giants lord i pray that we will say what is in our hand what has god put in our hand what has god placed in our hand and that we will not listen to the enemy's lies that we can do nothing that we are helpless but we will say god has enabled me to do what he has not 
He is not tempting me above what I am able, but here we are able to do. We are able to go up and take the country. We are able to do what God's called us to do. Lord, I pray for faith to rise in our hearts tonight, that Lord, we will not shake, that we will not tremble, that we will not give up, that we will not be hopeless, but in every situation in our lives, we will say, our God is mighty to the pulling down of every stronghold. Lord, if it's addiction that we're facing, if it's relationship problems that we're facing if our children have wandered away from you lord whatever it is we say god is good because you're going to show yourself powerful in every one of those things you are going to do it you are my god and you are with me and if god is with me who can be against me lord i pray that we will take the common thing that you put in our hand and we will not call it little and we will not compare ourselves with others and say I am nothing, I am nobody, but Lord, we will say, God has put this in my hand, and I am able to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Lord. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you for um, instruction tonight, Lord. Father, I just bless your people tonight. I thank you, Lord, that uh, even in the places, Lord, where we need to, that you would just begin stirring in us, uh, even in those places where we need to repent, where we need to break agreement with things, uh, even while we're standing here tonight, Lord, that you would speak to us. God, you only reveal to heal. And so we just thank you, Lord. We just open our hearts. We open our minds to you tonight, Lord. Anything that needs to go, just let it go tonight, we pray in the name of Jesus. Father, I bless your people. I thank you, Father, for sweet sleep tonight. I thank you, Father, for dreams and visit visitations from you. I thank you for strategies, Lord, being revealed in the night, for blueprints revealed in the night. I thank you, Father, for courage being imparted, God, uh, in dreams and in visions. I thank you, Father, that we would live the life of, of that Bible that we read, God, that we would come up, Lord, we would come up, God, we would see, we would hear, we would know because of you. So I just thank you, Father, that uh, we are a people here, one heart, one mind, one purpose at SRC, and that is to love you with all of our hearts, God, to be obedient to all that you say, to uh, receive that revelation of Jesus, our King and our Lord. So I speak health over you tonight. I speak strength over you tonight. I speak courage over you tonight. And I speak the joy of the Lord. I declare is your portion in Jesus' name. Go and be blessed. <laughs>